Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you, Idol. So, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth installment of our archaeology webinar series here at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Entraces Asia. Today's lecture is presented by Dr. Anne-Marc Velashvili and is entitled Manisi Hominins, Morphology, Behavior, Lifestyle and Death. The webinar is jointly hosted by Aido Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rick Fuentes, and me. This webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, Asia, and the RIT and its Eduardo Aboitis Sandbox Zone. Thank you all for joining us today for another exciting lecture. It's a privilege and a great pleasure to have Dr. Anne Mark Velashvili in our webinar today. Those of you who frequently join our webinars will know that this is the second talk about one of the most exciting and important prehistoric sites, Manisi. After David Lotki Panitze uh, introduced us to the excavations and the Manisi hominins last semester, today Dr. Anne Mark Velashvili will present the latest news about the ongoing research at Manisi and the oldest hominin fossils outside of Africa. Anne-Marc Velashvili has a PhD in natural sciences from the University of Zurich and holds an Erasmus Mundus master's degree in quaternary and prehistory. She graduated from the stomatological faculty of Tbilisi State Medical University and she's a professor at the University of Georgia, a senior researcher at the Georgia National Museum and an invited lecturer at the Tbilisi State University. And Anne has been coordinating the Manisi International Paleoanthropology Field School since 2009. But now I hand over the microphone to Mylene, who knows Anne very well, and she will tell us a bit more about our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Mylene. Thank you very much, Alfred. It's a great pleasure to have uh, one of my good, good friends with us here this afternoon. Uh, Annie Margvashvili is a senior researcher and member of the Dimanisi Expedition, a closely knit team of highly competent scientists of the Georgian National Museum that has been leading a wider team that includes global experts who have been working on the human evolution site of Manisi, Georgia, for at least two decades. She is coordinator, as you mentioned, of the 13-year-old Manisi uh, Paleoanthropology Field School, a yearly month-long international summer field school, which personally I can say has got to be one of the best and richest experiences a student in archeology span um, can have. She was educated as a dentist and comes from a family of dentists in Georgia. Annie put her training in dentistry to good use when she shifted to archaeology and became a paleoanthropologist, specializing in hominin dentition. Annie is now an expert in this field and is author or co-author of numerous publications about the early humans of Manisi in a number of major scientific journals. Annie and I met in 2013 when I first came to Georgia to attend the field school and we have been great friends since. After me, two other Philippine students have gone to Manisi. And when the pandemic hit in 2020, through Annie's leadership, the field school was able to pivot quickly to the online format quite, quite early on. Because of this, around 20 students from the Philippines were able to participate in the Manisi Paleoanthropology Field School Online 2020. Annie is also part of the Orosmani team, which has been making the news recently, like a month ago, with their own new discoveries, particularly a human tooth from the Orosmani site, still in the Manisi region. The site is of the same age as Manisi, 1.8 million years old. So I turn you over now to Edo uh, before going on to uh, my very good friend, Annie Marcalaccio. 
Okay, uh, thank you, um, Ma'am Maylene. I will now briefly read the abstract. Um, the Manisi is an archaeological site, Georgia, South Caucasus, dated to 1.8 million years ago. It is one of the best contextualized sites in the world, where five well-preserved hominin skulls have been discovered and attributed to the same value. The Manisi hominins show morphological differences and therefore Many scientists have thought them to belong to different species. Recent, researches, recent research has shown that even though the differences are present, it does not exceed the level of variation observed in modern human chimpanzee groups, thus allowing scientists to assume that the differences observed in Dimanisi is an expect, expected intraspecific variation combined with aging. The Manisi hominins had had a turbulent life with a dangerous environment to survive in that was rich in big predators such as leopards, giant cheetahs, saber-toothed cats, giant hyenas, and clim climatic conditions with all four seasons. Here we present how the Manisi hominins looked like, how they aged, what their lifestyle was, whether or not they had suffered from disease, and discuss poss possible causes of death. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Dr. Mark Willis. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. I'm um, honored and um, a little bit, you know, uh, stressed. I, I've heard so many nice things about me. I don't know if I deserve <laughs> those uh, wonderful words. Thank you very much. It's an honor to speak in front of you, and I hope my I will not disappoint, and my presentation will be interesting for for the audience. So I will not um, hold you too much. I will just get get to work and uh, present you our recent re uh, research. Um, but before um, before I present the latest new uh, latest news of our research, I want to make an overview about Edmanisi. So the, my presentation will be with a bigger overview picture, what is going on, and then the latest research, what what we have discovered. So let me share the presentation. Um, is it all okay? Visible? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, so, um, well, we are all here in uh, uh, specialists and experts in the field of human evolution, so I will not keep you talking about the human evolutionary tree, uh, where sadly the only survivors are now us somewhere up on the top, and uh, everybody else uh, went extinct. Yeah, but I want to concentrate on the time when uh, humans left Africa. So, of course, it is um, well known for everybody that cradle of humankind is Africa and um, the oldest hominins are discovered in Africa. But at some point, around two million years ago, humans leave Africa. At least that's what the evidence says today, right? And the point where, um, uh, the, where these um, uh, earliest humans were discovered is Manisi. Southern Caucasus, Georgia. Um, Manisi, is a, mm, Manisi is a beautiful place, not only because uh, I work there, but it, it genuinely is a pretty place. Um, it's wonderful to work there. Climatic conditions are nice. It's never too cold or never too hot. So uh, environmentally it's very nice. It's located in Georgia, in the Southern part of Georgia, Georgian Lesser Caucasus, uh, bordering to uh, Armenia, close to Armenia. It's uh, dated 1.8, 1.7 million years. And as you know, it's the earliest evidence of Homo out of Africa. Uh, the Manisi, the location, uh, the site is located on the confluence of the, it's located on the promontory, basically. It's a triangular shaped promontory. And on the top, you have um, the Manisi. Below of the promontory, we have the lava. Uh, the basaltic lava that uh, erupted like 1.85 million years ago and made nice base for this promontory. And this promontory excavation site is on top of it, so here.
Uh, sorry for that. Um, hopefully, it will just take uh, a little while until our speaker can reconnect. While we're waiting for Annie to get back on, uh, I can attest to what she said that uh, Dimanisi is in general just a pretty place. It really is. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, I excavated there in 2013. And she's back. Welcome back, Annie. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, modern technology, sometimes internet decides to... No problem. Just reconnect. Yes. And so uh, run the <laughs> PowerPoint. Yes. Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear it? Uh, no, not yet. Oh my God. Now? We, we can hear you, but uh, no screen share so far. Dr. Mark Belashvili, maybe you can uh, try to leave the Zoom room first and then try to re-enter. Oh, okay. Edo, maybe you can work your magic just like before. The other times where we've had similar problems. <laughs> And you well, always fix it. Uh, I need a copy of your PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, okay. So again, while we we're waiting for Annie to get back on, uh, Manisi is a really pretty place and uh, very accessible from the capital city of Tbilisi. You just drive for about an hour and 30 minutes. Very easy drive, very beautiful landscape. Uh, you'll encounter some, some sheep and some pigs along the way. And it's beautiful. The, the lower Caucasus mountains are are beautiful as well. And uh, so Manisi, Annie will be telling us later about it. Uh, there's, a, there's a fortress at the site on the promontory. Uh, I don't wanna preempt her talk, but uh, there's an existing uh, Orthodox Christian church with a priest. And uh, you know, I, I'm sick right now and I've been eating Manisi honey that I brought back from 2019 that the priest uh, in the monastery there produces. And I'm so glad I, I went through the pain of bringing home a huge jar and I'm now enjoying that. <laughs> so it's a, it's, you can see 360 degrees when you're at the fort, we're on, you, when you're on top of one of the walls of the fortress. So you can imagine just how valuable that was uh, in terms of security, uh, whether to the medieval people or the early Bronze Age people or even the early hominids uh, that Annie will be talking to us about uh, when the internet allows. Uh, Mylene? Ah, oh, you're back. Hey. You're back, yeah. So let's try uh, again. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep them busy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
Uh, Dr. Pathlick from Mylene. Let's try to turn off our cameras. So we'll okay, let's the try that. back. Yeah, I'm afraid that didn't work and we lost Ann uh, again. Maybe uh, we can ask her for uh, her a copy of the PowerPoint. It was working perfect right before we went on live stream. Do you think the live stream might have anything to do with it? I, I wouldn't know. It, it hasn't so far affected uh, us previously, or I don't what, what do you think? Would that be a problem? It's a different connection. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah of course, as, as usual, it was working perfectly when we tried it uh, just before uh, the webinar began. <laughs> yeah, Murphy is in the room. So I, I, I just sent Annie a message asking if she could send Edo a copy of her PowerPoint so that Edo can work his magic like he did with uh, Jeff Schwartz's talk and some other talks where we had similar problems. That might help, yeah. Uh, normally, we would have fixed this before uh, going live, but... Um, it was okay before we went live. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Anne is back. Hi, hi Anne. I think I'm back now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, not at all. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. There now. You go. Yes. Well, now. That sorry. looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I changed the location. So. Uh, that, that could do the trick. Let's try again. <laughs> Yes, let's let's continue. Now the sharing is okay. Wonderful, yeah. Excellent. Very good. Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you, and I apologize for this, but sometimes uh, internet uh, decides to fail us, and yes, it's beyond our um, uh, beyond our power to change things sometimes. So um, yes, let's continue. I mean, it's a beautiful place and it's located in Southern Caucasus and it's dated to 1.8, 1.7 million years, Manisi, I mean, and um, it's a place of the earliest um, evidence uh, out of Africa. Uh, and it's a beautiful place, as I said, it's located on top of the, on top of the basaltic lava <coughs> at the confluence of two rivers. And so when you are, excavating in Benicia, you're sitting on the promontory and just overlooking those two, uh, two beautiful rivers. And the excavation runs within the walls of the medieval city because the excavations started uh, as, um, as uh, excavations of the medieval city, not the Paleolithic. Nobody thought it was Paleolithic when they started to excavate the area. Uh, but then mm, interesting bones were recovered, like rhinoceros tooth, and obviously in Georgia you don't have in the medieval times rhinoceros, and it was the place of earliest um, uh, early Paleolithic site, like Pleistocene site. Uh, since then, Manisi in Manisi we discovered um, numerous uh, amount of bones, and uh, out of these. The, uh, the spotlight of my research is obviously uh, hominin bones, and we have five hominin skulls uh, with uh, five hominin crania with four mandibles. As you see, they are very well preserved. Uh, all of them have basically everything except one skull, one cranium. One cranium is only colored, so as you see, it doesn't have the face or the uh, base of the cranium, and neither does it have the mandible. These mandibles, I mean, this is an extraordinary thing because uh, you find those um, uh, crania and then you find the mandibles and they do a perfect fit with the, with the 
with the with the skulls, right? Um, and uh, this way, you cannot only study just the morphology, but you can look at the paleo populations. Look at you can look at them how they looked like. You can see how they. Uh, how variable they were, um, how they aged, because in Phoenicia we have different age groups. For example, this one in the middle is a uh, juvenile. It's, it's, a, it's a teenager, more or less. Then we have a subadult. Then we have two elderly individuals. Then we have an adult. So basically what we have is uh, uh, representatives of all age groups. Of course, they are five, but they are still representing the age groups. and. It's like a, a, an umbrella covering the paleo population. You can really uh, discuss how they looked like as youngsters and how did they age. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity. But we not only have, of, of course, cranial bones, but we have the postcranial bones. And those uh, uh, postcranial bones are up to 100 now by now, and they are... Um, uh, they are amazing because it gives a lot of opportunities to study the mm, human evolution. Interesting thing about Manisi is that not only we have this numerous amount of bones, but they are found very close from each other. Each of these cubicles is one uh, square meter. So as you see, all of these bones are found very close to each other and each color code uh, represents each individual. For example, the red ones here, they are uh, they are the young individual, the, the, the juvenile I mentioned, and all the red spots, and, and they are so close discovered from each other. This is the cranium, the, this is a mandible, <coughs> and the others are the postcranial bones. Uh, the green one is the toothless individual. So, and the blue one is this big skull. So, as you see, they are very close from each other discovered, and um, the reason Manisi is so fascinating is that it's not only the amount, but it's because they are uh, the concentration of the bones in one location and the perfect datation. Because as I told you, Promontory is located on the basaltic lava and we have exact datation of the lava. So this way, um, um, Manisi is one of the best contextualized uh, archeological sites. And uh, Manisi has discovered in 2005, we recovered this um, uh, fifth, fifth skull that we call. It's the most complete skull of early Homo until now. Uh, it's, the, it's like an anatomy atlas. You have everything preserved. You can look at it and it's just uh, uh, fascinating. It basically speaks to you. And I wanted to show you this video, how well preserved it is and to pay attention on, on, on some aspects. Like you see, all the anatomical features are uh, are there, and if you look at it here, we have the mm, uh, fractured uh, um, zygomatic art and healed during life, and that's from below. <clears throat> and here is the fractured uh, zygomatic art. And what I wanted you to pay attention because it has the fractured zygomatic art before I run the video, uh, pay attention to this area. Uh, this is the temporomandibular joint disorder. And we assume that if there was a fracture during life and when there is a fracture, there is pain, uh, the individual is not able to chew on uh, the fractured side. So, they chew on the other side, which you can also see by the tooth wear. The tooth wear is much more uh, visible on the left side than on the right side. And if you chew too much on one side and you overload it, then you might cause also TMJ problems, which is visible here. You can see the TMJ disorder <clears throat> and the fractured zygomatic arch. So uh, then the beautiful um, reconstruction by John Gorchi was done because this is such an exceptional skull. It requires an artistic reconstruction, which you can see in the Georgian National Museum today. Uh, but this skull causes a lot of questions and a lot of um, um, discussions in the scientific community. Uh, as you know, in our field, people like to 
uh, discovering new species is always excitement and people like to have more species, more names. But if we look at it, and the Manisi gave a lot of stir to this. When you look at those five, uh, five skulls, Mm, and uh, you try to describe the morphological similarities and differences, obviously this big cranium stands out of the rest of the group. And then, uh, and then many scientists, very uh, honorable, respectable scientists, they still think that it might not be one and the same um, species, but it can be two different species, like these four belonging to one species, but with this one belonging to uh, separate individuals, a separate separate group, right? And um, so to look at this in um, all now already ten years ago, there was the research done, and um, and uh, with uh, different kind of approaches, uh, three D approaches, two D approaches, qualitative quantitative analysis, all kinds you can uh, you can imagine. Uh, we've collected the data and then compared. And when, when, uh, when we ran the, <clears throat> the analysis, what came out was that, the, uh, of course, you compare it with modern human groups uh, and modern chimpanzee groups, because that's the best of the comparison you can do, the living species, right? Um, the closest relatives to early uh, homo are modern human, um, uh, modern homo sapiens and uh, early and um, uh, chimpanzee groups, right? So when we compare this, um, um, uh, the shape, the shape, like the, the 3D shape of the, the Manisi individuals and um, modern human and modern chimpanzee groups, we saw that the difference in vari variation is not more than what we observe in modern humans and modern chimpanzees. So what, what was uh, shown is that the variation that we see does not exceed the level of variation that we see in modern human and modern chimpanzee groups. For example, this is pantroglodytes troglodytes, pantroglodytes verus, and so on. This is pampaniscus. So the variation in Venisi does not exceed the variation we see in modern, human, modern uh, chimps or modern humans. Uh, then there was uh, uh, run this resampling analysis uh, because, of course, it's very, you cannot do statistics with five individuals, right? So you have to do some kind of simulations. And um, what was done was that uh, they were uh, picked uh, five random individuals for, uh, from um, chimp groups and from uh, human groups and compares the distance, uh, compared the variation, the, the differences. And what, what you see, what we saw was that Manisi again falls within the range of variation. And this, and this uh, resampling analysis was done like thousand times, thousand iterations. And as you see, every time Manisi falls within the range of uh, variation of the modern human or modern uh, chimpanzee groups. So basically, uh, the research has shown that um, the Manisi hominins do not uh, represent a huge variation. It's of course for the eye, you see the difference, but numbers don't say those things. So maybe we have to think that it's not two different species, but it's one group, just different variation. Like for example, I look different from um, one of the big basketball players, right? And so then uh, well, the approach was, shall we look at them if we are in the same time and they differ in morphology, what do we do? Uh, is it, um, we, shall we split them in different species? Like shall we divide and we have species one, species two, species three, species four, because they are different in morphology or uh, shall we put them in the same group and uh, uh, put them as a, as a paleodeme, right? As, as one group, as a variation within the group. For example, of course, uh, we know that a fossil sample is likely to present the paleodeme if two conditions are met. One, they have to come from the special in temporally constrained space, which we have, like the Manisi is uh, special in temporally very close, like geographically, it's like within a few square meters, as you saw. And geologically as well, we have a nice um, 
nice detention, which is exactly, uh, um, there is no um, doubt about the datation of Manisi. And the second point is that this, within the sample variation must be similar to the range of closest relatives like humans and chimpanzees. And yes, Manisi does not exceed this variation level. So what do we see in Manisi is this variation? We think so. But of course, many, many uh, wonderful researchers don't, don't, might not think the same and the science is good because we, Mm, it's it's a platform of discussion and we always have to discuss because that's the best thing we can do, right? And every new discovery and every new chance comes with a discussion. Uh, so mm. some scientists don't think, sometimes scientists think that it's still very different and we cannot put them in the same group, mm, that the uh, mandibles are too different and that the crania is too different. And if you look at it, this big mandible is really uh, too, too, too big, too enormous, too synthesis is too straight up. And uh, um, also dental anatomy is different. So maybe we have to put them in two separate groups. But then just to, you know, to analyze it, what we did was um, uh, we looked at um, chimpanzees. So, like if you look at the sample of chimpanzees here, um, what you see is what you might think is that uh, they are very different. I mean, for, for a non-professional, for any normal human being from the street, if you show this picture, it's just uh, skulls, right? And yes, they are all the same, but as long, as soon as you start working with them, uh, they are, um, they are not skulls, they are individuals and you start to recognize them. And if you recognize them, and if you do not know their gender, for example, whether it's male or female, the first thought is that, okay, this, this one looks pretty robust and it might be a male. Whereas this one is quite slender and could be a female. Whereas this one is definitely a male, right? And maybe this one is a clear female. But because this comes from the collection where we know exactly where they, if they are male or female, all this line is female and all this line is male. So what you see is that even within the females and males, you have more masculine or more feminine uh, representation. So what you have to think is that there is a lot of variation in robusticity. Do they still look different? Is it more different than this, than the chimpanzees? To me, not so. Is, is Manisi now so exceptionally different? I honestly don't think so. Another question, another topic was about the root morphology and the dental morphology. For example, Manisi, the uh, subadult individual has a uh, uh, dental root morphology, for example, of this premolar has one root only. Another one has Thomas root, like little bifurcation at the end. And the third one has nice double rooted premolars. Yes, they are different, but this is normal in modern humans. As Mylene uh, already mentioned about me, I come from the family of dentists. So um, I am not a pra practicing dentist now, but uh, I, I read a lot in theory. And of course, I discuss a lot with my family. And then I was discussing with my mom, who is a, th a therapeutic dentist, and I asked her, so how are the root canals and roots of the lower premolars? And she was like, yes, it's, it's variable. You cannot say sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one. And we have this within the Georgian population, because my mom works in Georgia and she is uh, treating the Georgian patients mostly, right? Maybe not, uh, I mean, Georgian, um, uh, Georg Georg not, not Georgian ethnic groups only, but the people live in, who live in Georgia. So it's not the big worldwide variation. And within there, we have a lot of variation in premolar. So why wouldn't early homo have this variation? Why wouldn't they have two premolars, two, two roots of the premolars or three canals. Why not? If we have it now, why not them? So um, yes, 
I think this is normal and it depends. It depends, it's very individual and premolars are one of the most variable teeth. So why not have variation in the root numbers and the shape of the teeth? Uh, but jaws not only tell information, you cannot only describe the morphology, but it's very interesting to see um, how the, our dentognatic system is affected by aging, because of course we age, and when we age, something has to change. And um, I, I always say teeth are the drivers of human evolution. Teeth are very important. They are they are uh, a reason of success of some species because you have so much access to food. And if you think teeth are so close related to our uh, central nervous system, so to, to the brain, so that there is minimal delay from jaw, from biting uh, to, to our sensors, it's close to our eyes, to our nose, right? Because teeth are very important. And to preserve the teeth somehow, uh, we need those teeth. Teeth define the length of our life sometimes. Maybe not in modern populations now in modern humans because we have dentists, luckily. But in previous populations when there were no teeth, it could, be, uh, um, it could define the length of the life of the individual, right? If now animals in the wild have problems with dentition and infections, they might die because there is nothing to they won't be able to feed and they will, they will have infections and treat it and they will die, right? So somehow our body uh, tries to preserve the teeth for as long as possible. Some animals have different adaptations uh, to this and others have different. Our, our um, adaptation to, to preserving the dentition is we have to compensate for the dental wear we wear our teeth. When we chew, we wear. Modern populations, uh, like modern living humans, don't wear them so much because our food is very soft now. We hardly need to chew them. But before, the teeth were heavily used, let's say. And so this beautiful, nice dental morphology would turn into something like this flat. And it's not only just the shape that changes, but we lose a lot of, um, lot of hard tissue. And by losing the hard tissue, we might lose the teeth, it changes, it affects our TMJ and everything. So somehow our body tries to adapt to it and it keeps the dentognatic homeostasis. So body tries to adapt to age-related changes. And this is um, uh, uh, represented in three specific compensatory mechanisms. For example, if you imagine that this is a plane of occlusion, plane of occlusion is where the lower and upper teeth, um, uh, upper teeth meet, like contact. And then you're throughout life, um, and chewing, we lose heart tissue, the, the, the crown area, the, uh, the, uh, the contact area for, with, between the upper and lower teeth, so the top area of the crowns, we wear them out. But to compensate for this, what happens in life is that the, the teeth start to erupt. So they erupt continuously. For example, when you think that your teeth have erupted and they are there forever, no, they always move in your mouth. Um, this is one of the problems of uh, implantology. I know it for, again from my family. Uh, implants don't move, they don't grow. And when they put implants, the rest of the teeth grow. And sometimes what happens is that, uh, oh, uh, the patient will come complaining, oh, my implant uh, became shorter. It's, it's somehow uh, short in my, compared to the rest of the teeth. And the thing is, it's not short, it's just where it was. The rest of the teeth uh, have um, grown out, so erupted. It's like when you go to a hairdresser and they cut your hair and then you complain, oh, my hair grew. Yes, that's what they do, it grows. So the teeth also erupt. So you cannot complain to a dentist that your implant is short. Implant is short because it doesn't move. It, it doesn't have the nat natural structure to to, to grow, it's, it's a metal. 
it's not a root, it's not periodontal ligament that helps uh, the mobility of the tooth, right? So this is one that our teeth erupt constantly to compensate the lost heart tissue. So the, to compensate the wear, but the wear does not only affect the top areas, but it affects also, also the contact points between the teeth of the neighboring teeth. Because chewing is very heavy process. And when we chew, the teeth have to move. Otherwise, if they are stuck stably, you might break them because there is so much force uh, coming from chewing, right? So when we have this movement, it flattens out the area here. And to compensate these flat areas, the teeth migrate from behind towards front, like from back towards forward, which is called the mesial drift. This might reach up to one centimeter, half a centimeter. Even in modern populations, you lose this, uh, this space. Up to half a centimeter, you lose this space. So our dental arc length becomes shorter when we age. And the third one is the lingual tipping because of course here the back teeth move forward but what can we do with the front teeth they cannot move anywhere right and they and they lose these sides as well they lose these areas too so for this what they do is teeth move inwards like like a fan they just close inwards and this is called lingual tipping basically if you measure them axis of the main, uh, the main axis of the tooth and the mandibular canal, the angle becomes from obtuse to acute. And with these three compensatory mechanisms, the continuous eruption, medial drift and lingual tipping, as you see also mandibular morphology changes. For example, the symphysis that is, that was protruding and uh, becomes flat because of the lingual tipping and the dental arc becomes short. So there are changes that are morphological changes that are accepted with aging because this is followed by the, because fo it follows the compensatory mechanisms that are caused by tooth wear. So uh, that, how does this now affect morphological variation? Do we see the same things in Manisi, for example? And, um, I would say yes, and let's have a look. For example, if this is the main axis of the tooth and if this is a mandibular canal, uh, the, uh, the angle between them is 95 degrees. This is a super dog, a little bit older, and then the degree is 93. This is an old individual. And then the uh, angle between the tooth and the mandibular canal is 73 degrees. And in the toothless individual, we have 71. Of course, uh, you might ask if it's a toothless, how can you measure the main axis of the tooth? But you can measure because tooth reflects uh, the alveolar, uh, alveolar socket exactly reflects the shape of the tooth. And if the alveolar socket is present, so alveolar socket is the place where the tooth is uh, located in, during life. If the alveolar socket is, it, is present, it absolutely perfectly reflects the uh, uh, main axis of the tooth. So, and in the toothless individual, it was 71 degrees. Then we measured the continuous eruption. And uh, this is a subadult individual and it was like seven millimeters roughly. And then in the old adult individual, it was like 15 millimeters. Uh, of course, everything was compared to modern human populations, like not modern living populations, but the hunter-gatherer groups to have some comparative, uh, realistic comparative sample. And we compared it with Australians and Greenlanders. And the pattern is same in all of them. As you see, the gray lines are modern humans and the uh, red line is uh, early homo from Manisi and Nariokotoma boy. And what we see is that if you look at this, this is a schematic representation from which uh, I did in PowerPoint, for example, and that's how uh, what is expected to do. And then if you compare it with the Dmanisi, somehow they are very similar. So what we see is that maybe they are um, 
maybe it's only uh, age related. Of course, it's individual biological differences and one may be robust more than the other, but there is also aging that we have to take into account. Moreover, the interesting thing is I measured the distance between the, the toothless individual. The toothless individual has lost all his teeth throughout, during life. And uh, it's also a very interesting case because surviving in that time is hard without teeth. And um, to have this kind of alveolar resorption, it takes uh, some time. It doesn't come from one day to another. It, it's up to, um, we think at least two to three years it took until the full resorption because alveolar bone where the teeth are located and teeth are very close to each other, whatever, if one of them has a problem, the, uh, the other one will have it too. For example, if you lose the tooth, you will lose the alveolar bone. And if you're losing the alveolar bone, eventually you will lose the tooth. If somebody has periodontal disease, which affects the alveolar bone, eventually they will lose the tooth. But when there is a tooth loss uh, because of something and you don't put an implant right away or something, then the alveolar bone slowly resorbs as well. So this individual, it, it would have taken two to three years to have this kind of huge resorption. And I measured it and it's like about 16 millimeters. This is, this is a lot of height that this guy, and this is minimum 16 millimeters because also front, front area is lost. And then I wanted to just compare the, the big mandible with this one. And if, if more or less I put this um, uh, green line, the height about 16 to 18 millimeters here, and then you overlay the jaw uh, the, the, the toothless individual on top, you see that it, it's comparable. Maybe they are not exactly similar, but they are comparable. You know, it's not that much of a huge mandible and maybe it was just robust, but it's not as big as, uh, as we perceive. So are they still the different groups? Probably, in my opinion, not, but of course there is uh, more to discuss. Um, do you, and if you remember in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that there is, um, we discovered this beautiful uh, skulls, right? Five skulls and four of them have everything preserved, but one of them does not have face and we decided to look into this individual because this individual has asked a lot of questions throughout this, these years. And, and Mylene was there when we were doing this, <laughs> this research with Marta. <laughs> we were in the room uh, with three of us who we were sitting there and, and looking at some uh, um, pathologies and some interesting aspects. And so finally the, the research is out. So this is the first, uh, first cranium that was discovered in Manisi in 1999. And it is quite well preserved for the age, like 1.8 million, 1.7, okay. But um, it doesn't have the face. And it has some, 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 some things like, for example, here, some, uh, some bumps on it. And we decided to look into it more into more details. There were four main lesions that we described. There was one on the occipital area, one on the parietal area, and two on the frontal bones. And these are the, the images. Um, of course, it's uh, too, too, I mean, you, a lot of things uh, leave uh, marks on the bones, but obviously not all the diseases leave marks on the bones. Diseases are um, they can be lifelong, but they cannot, they may not affect the bone. And uh, those that affect the bones may not affect the cranium, right? So it's a very rare chance to have some kind of pathology affecting the cranium and uh, we would being able to detect. Uh, as I told once, not all the diseases affect, and when they affect, sometimes they don't affect the cranium, but affect the mm, vertebrae or so on and so forth. 
So we were lucky to find those. And the first thing is you do, you run the differential diagnosis, what it could be. And in the beginning, you are more uh, like, um, you want, you want a lot of things come up, like, could it be um, tuberculosis? Could it be metastatic cancer? Maybe it's a cyst. So you run all kinds of um, comparative uh, analysis. But the first is obviously trauma. Uh, because, of course, if there is a strong blood force trauma, it affects, the, it affects the bone and it could leave a mark. Uh, the others, as I mentioned, maybe it's a cyst, maybe it's a, some neoplastic condition, maybe some kind of uh, infectious diseases. And, and um, paleopathological literature is rich, is very, very rich. It's really a voluminous, let's say. So uh, we looked through them and, and we came to the conclusion that some of those lesions are more similar and one of them is a little bit different. For example, this lesion on the parietal bone, as you see here, this uh, uh, here in the middle, the diplo is basically completely gone. So what we think, here you can see. So what we think is that this could be traumatic. Um, and then we compared to the literature. So we compared it to the other traumatic lesions of the similar age and it's abundant in fossil record. I mean, in 21st century, when we are now sitting here on different ends of the planet sometimes and talk and able to communicate and then there is war ongoing. I, I mean, humans are for me, like how can we not learn to um, live happily in a way and enjoy life, right? But I guess this comes maybe from you know, it's our, in our genes, I don't know. They were all the time fighting. I don't know what, the, what the, the, they were not so many, not, there was nothing, not much to share. They could have occupied the whole world. They were not millions and billions like we are today, but they, of course, uh, we are fighting all the time. Uh, everybody's fighting. It's, 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 it's in the nature, we have to fight, sadly. And they were fighting too. So they, you find the, traumatic lesions in erectus, in Neanderthals, in sapiens. Today you have, uh, you have violence on every step of, the, of our lives, sadly. So why wouldn't they fight? And then we compared it with, uh, with um, Sangiran fossilis has described it. And uh, Sangiran also has similar lesions on the cranium. So probably they were just hitting each other with some blunt tools, maybe stone or maybe uh, wood. Uh, and causing traumatic lesions. And if you compare these two, for example, with Sangiran and Manisi, you see that the lesions are very similar, as you see. Then we compare this with the Chinese fossils and uh, the, the lesions are also quite similar here. You can see the reduction and the diplo area and, and the, uh, when you compare the Dmanisi ones, they are very similar. So yes, we, we assume that there was uh, interpersonal violence and when you have multiple injuries, um, yeah, they are usually associated with interpersonal violence. And it was interpersonal violence, but the individual survived it and it didn't die because of the bumps in the head. And um, yeah, the and the 2280, so the first, uh, first cranium has minimum three of those kind of traumas. And do we find it in other Manisi hominins? That's the case of the future research, obviously, and we will pursue it. But um, just as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, for example, this one has fractured zygomatic arch. You know, when people fight, where the fist goes? Here. So. If, if it goes in the face, the first area to fracture is the zygomatic. Sadly, also in the, um, in the families, like when there is, when, um, when 
uh, how do you call family violence is very often this is the area of the fracture too, unfortunately. So, of course, this is, uh, we did not publish it yet. We didn't talk about it. It's just the fact that it's fractured, but could, it could be because of the violence. It could be because it just fell down from the tree and smashed his face, but you never know. So, with this tree, we, we, uh, we agree that it is um, a traumatic lesion, but the fourth one was a little bit different. As you see, the base of the trauma, the well, base of the lesion is a little bit different. It's a little bit more like a, more, there is more structure to it. So we decided to look more into details because, uh, because of it. It could be trauma, but we went a little bit further. And we thought, could it be treponematosis? Of course, treponema is the bacteria that causes um, the treponemal disease. And today it's one of those is the syphilis. Uh, we don't mean that it was syphilis, obviously. Syphilis is much younger. But we also don't know when this bacteria existed two million years ago, what kind of um, uh, pathology would it cause in the two million year old individuals, right? So we don't know how would it have been manifested in early, in early humans because bacteria also evolve and diseases also evolve. But because this is, doesn't look like uh, trauma and it differs from the rest of the lesions, so we decided to look into it. And as you see, it's quite deep, but the diplo is still present uh, and um, there is no, yeah, it doesn't look like traumatic lesion. Like, for example, comparing to this one, they are very different. So we looked at the infections and we, 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 we thought it's um, triponemal disease because triponemal disease is recorded in chimpanzees, gorillas, humans, also baboons. So it's, it's recorded in apes and monkeys. Um, those, this disease can pass from um, skin to skin contact and it can last uh, lifelong, of course, with remissions and relapses. So why not that? Of course, it's uh, a possibility. It's not a final diagnosis. It's, we, it's just an assumption, but we, we offer this assumption and pro possibly it's a, it was an early, earliest evidence of trypanematosis. And then we compared it with um, uh, skeletal, um, skeletal record because there are no comparative uh, triponemal cases of early homo. So you have to compare with modern cases. And we found some similarities like this prehistoric uh, Pacific Island individual has more or less similar lesion as the Edmonisi one. Um, so maybe we maybe we are dealing with one of the earliest cases of trypanematosis but yes it maybe there will be people who will oppose it and i'm happy to uh, listen and uh, learn more about it but uh, the funny thing of the manisi and the interesting is that it doesn't stop to surprise us it always gives new and new uh, things and there is so much more to study and so much more to offer and one of them is, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, this individual doesn't have the face. Please remember it. This individual does not have the face. And on the back of the skull, on the occipital area, there were discovered two of the holes here, punctures. And this always caused, also previously caused questions where do these punctures come from? And that's where we were sitting uh, again with Mylene, Martha, we were talking <laughs> there. And, um, and uh, we decided to look at it and uh, uh, we measured the fracture, uh, the, the angle of the fractures, because uh, uh, when there is um, uh, fracture of the uh, dry bone uh, and the wet bone. Wet bone is when there is still flesh on it, right? And the dry bone is uh, after death, post-mortem, when the 
bone is already dry and it doesn't have a circulation in it, right? So these fractures uh, differ. Mm, for example, when the wet bone is fractured, the angle is acute. But when the dry bone is fractured, the angle is right or obtuse. So when we measured this uh, circling, the, the um, um, what is perforation circle around the, uh, the angles of the uh, perforations, we, dis we discovered that almost all of them were quite acute, as you see. All, all the points were acute. So this indicates that most probably these uh, fractures happened to the wet bone and uh, perimortem or antemortem, right? Well, if this happened during life, it wouldn't have survived these punctures be, uh, because there is no healing visible, but and uh, anyways, it would not survive this kind of big holes in the brain case, but uh, so probably it could have been the reason of death, right? But what causes this kind of fractures? You start to think, what could it be? So one of the first thoughts is because Manisi lived in very dangerous environment, rich, rich in carnivorous species, big carnivores. They were a huge uh, giant hyenas. There were leopards and there were um, saber tooth cats. So they definitely, of course, they were smart and managed to survive, but they would have been often, often uh, fallen as prey to them because this happens, right? In modern um, uh, ape populations, you have them when they are hunted by uh, big animals. And the monkeys, they are hunted often, right? Why wouldn't Manisi individuals be hunted? So uh, we measured the distances. So Martha did this. Um, uh, Martha Tappan is a taphonomist in uh, Manisi since many, many years already. I don't know, since 2000, I think. So, and then we compared, for example, these are the center of the holes of the Dmanisi here, the distance in centimeters, and then the millimeters. And, uh, uh, and then, the, uh, sorry, centimeters. And then this is a 10 centimeter cube. So this is the distance like 10 centimeter here. And these are, canine distances of the uh, big predators. For example, this is the homotherium discovered in Manisi. Uh, this is the megantherium discovered in Manisi. And then there is this uh, leopards and the, 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 the hyenas and the, the wolves and so on. And as you see, some of the animals fall within this 10 centimeter range of variation. So for example, the hyena could be, or homotherium could, could be the reason um, of those two punctures, right? Another interesting thing is that, and then we compared this um, fractures, for example, this is the baboon skull and uh, uh, it's a prey of the leopard. It's from the leopard then. Um, and as you see those, puncture holes are quite similar to them. And another thing that I wanted to pay your attention uh, is that I mentioned in the beginning, it doesn't have the face. And very often when animals catch their prey, they bite off their face. So that is one of the, one of the more, more often um, ways how uh, predators eat their prey. They chew off the face because then it's an easy access. And also mandible is so easy to fall off. It doesn't have much of the connection. It's with the, uh, the jaw falls off easily. Also it gets um, disarticulated faster than any other parts of the bone, right? And uh, have a pay attention here. You see here the uh, open, uh, parotic area of the uh, temporal uh, temporal mast mastoid area, so the temporal bone here. Um, this is also could be because of gnawing on it by an animal. Uh, this does not mean 
it's not definitive that it was a prey. We cannot exclude that, for example, scavenging birds could have made those holes. Mm, definitely, it's not that. Def it's not definitive that uh, uh, this individual was uh, uh, fell as prey to the uh, one of those big carnivores. But it's it's uh, it's an assumption and most most probable and most plausible cause. And then um, uh, when, the, the, when the paper came out soon after at the National Museum, uh, uh, our colleagues uh, uh, were visiting uh, for research and there was uh, Lorenzo Rook and his um, uh, student, I, no, I think he's a postdoc now, um, Saveri, and he said, oh, I loved your paper. And did you see the reconstruction um, uh, that was uh, done by, a uh, very famous paleo artist, uh, amazing paleo artist uh, who loves um, homotherium, so saber tooth cats. Uh, his name is Mauricio Anton from Spain. And um, then uh, I said, oh no, I haven't seen it. I have to see it. And then I saw this beautiful re artistic representation of uh, our Manisi hominid that could have fallen as prey to this a huge uh, 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 saber tooth cat. So this, uh, and the, you see the canines puncturing the, the skull and dragging him somewhere in the den to be eaten. So the Manisi offers a lot of information. You can, if you look, I mean, when, when you're working with the bones and you have uh, um, enough knowledge and imagination and also nice uh, wonderful teamwork to share and discuss your ideas you can tell a lot of stories so i think bones keep secrets and it needs more and more to unveil they can tell a lot of things about it so what i think is that manisi not what i think what what was manisi's life was really turbulent they had to survive they had to take care probably of each other because there was this toothless individual that had to, that lived for two or three years and they didn't have fire, at least we don't have the evidence of it, so they would not be cooking. So they must have been taking care of each other. They were managing to survive among these big creatures, um, predators, but sometimes probably fallen as prey, they wouldn't always manage to get away from them. And what we have to think that they were not so different from us uh, in terms of um, not only, uh, I mean, behavioral things are rooted far into evolution. So caring or you know, survival strategies or so, or aging, everything is, we evolve, but we have a lot that is kept in our, phylogeny, right? And what we have to keep in mind that there are there is variation and we, we cannot put them in different species um, as soon as we find some differences. We have to keep that aging effect, we have to keep the biology effect. So for example, we have huge man and we have not so big man and then you have huge variation among women and then you have variation among men and Yes, we are different and that makes us more interesting. So uh, maybe Manisi hominins have, were also just different, but they were interesting in their ways and we just have to look more into and find out more new interesting uh, discoveries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Anne. That was a wonderful and, and most exciting lecture and, and uh, a lot was, was really new, at least new to me. Uh, I, I, I really like those, those uh, uh, details that, that you presented. Also, I, I have to admit that uh, I am not really an, an expert in, <laughs> in, in most of it. I, I do user analysis, but I do it on stone tools. So uh, it's, it's a bit different, uh, uh, I'm afraid. But uh, 
what I find fascinating is, is and, and you presented it so uh, convincingly that this this variability we we see in, in Manisi and and um, the, the the questions uh, they raise the confusion probably uh, it caused. So I, I remember that the, the Manisi hominins they have been named and renamed and renamed again. Uh, I think the latest was Homo erectus ergaster georgicus. Is that still valid? That, that's a yeah. bit. Uh, yes. It <laughs> so, yes, it's, it's that sounds that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the name because uh, so Homo uh, because um, I mean Homo erectus because it's from the early Homo and they are not so different from the populations we find in Africa and in uh, uh, Asia. So it's something like. A, continuous lineage, but Georgicus is there because to to de denominate the location so that we know what we are talking about. Yes. All right, yeah, I, I was I was really wondering, but so Manisi hominin, that, that seems, that, that sounds a bit easier. Or is, is yes, I, 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 I think <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank then you very much, Annie. It's always fascinating to, to listen to your lectures. No? I, we've known each other for almost 10 years now, and I've attended so many of your lectures, especially during the pandemic. But each time, you really just pick up something new, and each time while you're talking, I'm doing this, and oh my gosh, shutting on my teeth, <laughs> realizing how, how uh, human dentition works. Uh, and it's not as easy as uh, putting a replacement there and it's going to stay with you forever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing once again. I remember in, in the field school, Annie, I had to do a PowerPoint on area fractal analysis. And uh, that was one of the things like, okay, I had no idea what it was all about. And it was about analysis of the surface of teeth. And Annie, Annie helped me out a lot in understanding that. So... Um, we have a question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, uh, not sure if I got distracted. One question about the perfor perforations was not found signs of remodulation, remodeling. I was thinking that is another sign that it died of it. Thanks for the lecture. This is from Bernardo Quiterio. Uh, no, that we don't have the signs of remodeling, not that we could trace it. So that's, probably uh, the reason of death, or if it was from the scavenging birds, then it was uh, short after death. So yeah, it, uh, it could have been the cause of the death, so really perimortem fractures or postmortem, but short, uh, uh, short after death, so that the scavenging birds would access the, I don't know, the brain case. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the question. It's it's interesting question. Thank you, Annie. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, you can write them on the chat box or or maybe ask directly. Uh, in the meantime, I just uh, oh there, Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Tanya Uldin, <laughs> one of the professors. Um, Hello. Hi, Anne. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful um, yeah presentation. Very interesting, and I would like also to um, thank you that you um, have stressed uh, about the uh, variation because you all, we always have this kind of uh, species uh, definition, and each bone you find in the past, there will be a new species, and then you see really the variation in modern populations and that you you have to define them also as a different species and more or less we are now um, yeah also uh, how you say uh, going away from this kind of species definition and we learned last uh, time with Dr. Larena that it doesn't really play a role in genetics so um, yeah I'm very happy about this uh, on the other hand, uh, also, um, I'm coming from forensics, so I would also agree that it's uh, <laughs> perimortem, these lesions. And I have another question for the, the survived trauma or something that you, you said yeah. that it might be a survived trauma. 
Um, of course, in forensics, um, when I used to glue skulls and uh, also uh, analyze them, um, we don't have survived trauma. So I have not really, I'm not exper experienced um, in, <clears throat> in this. Uh, did you use um, also modern medical literature for this survived trauma or did you only, because maybe I did misunderstood this, uh, did you only compare this in the fossil records? Thank you for the uh, interesting comment and the support of the variation and uh, thank you for the interesting question. Uh, yes, no, we compared, uh, I, actually I started with modern um, um, so modern literature, modern forensic literature, and then I went to compare because uh, one thing is, I think when we compare is, uh, one thing is to find similar in the, you want age group similar, like age, geological age group, you want to find something similar in those species. So that was not so easy because you don't have so many in early places. Mm -hmm. Basically that was uh, Sangiran and uh, uh, but basically yeah, that's, uh, that was it. Sangiran is more or less the same age that described the trauma. I have it listed, but now I don't remember all of them. It's a huge list. And, um, and then you just describe what could it, you, uh, I, you read upon what it could be. I didn't look on the modern bones. I didn't go and do the forensics, obviously, but uh, from the literature, it fell with all the criteria. So that's, that's how. So I started first with modern forensics and then, then go back to the records. Paleopathology, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Dr. Tanya Ulden. And uh, thanks for the answer, Annie. Uh, do we have any more questions? Just to share uh, what Annie mentioned earlier, uh, in, that was in 2019 when we were all together with Martha Tappen at the Georgia <laughs> National Museum. Uh, I was just a spectator. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I wasn't doing the study. I was watching Annie and Martha uh, examine uh, the skulls. And uh, yeah, so we were talking about the, the perforations in, in the back of the skull. Actually, these were have been talked about like way back, like, even in 2013, um, this was already being discussed. No? And I guess that's how long it takes to, to study. And besides, in Manisi, there are just so many specimens, uh, I guess. You can't study everything at the same time. So it's inevitably going to be spaced out. Uh, Skull 5 made the cover of science in 2013, yeah. uh, both the jaw and, and, and the cranium. Yeah, so uh, um, it's another uh, reason why Benisi is such a remarkable site. Uh, most of the fossils are so well preserved even the animal fossils, uh, it's amazing. Uh, and they just keep coming out of the ground. If you are a participant in, in the field school, most definitely you're going to end the field school finding something uh, yourself. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for, for students to learn from. Uh, I can't say enough. Uh, Georgia is a gorgeous country with gorgeous people and amazing sites like Manisi and now Orosmani. Uh, maybe Annie, you can tell us uh, about Orosmani. Um, this uh, was in the news quite recently, like a month ago, I think uh, September 8th or something like that. Yes. And um, maybe could you share a little about this um, with us uh, right now? Because uh, what we know is that, uh, I saw pictures of Bidzo, one of the scientists uh, who's our friend, uh, showing the tooth. And we know that before that, they were finding uh, some animal fossils um, at this site that is actually a few kilometers or 20, 20 or 30 kilometers away from Manisi. Yeah. So thank you, Annie. Yeah. So, um, um, Orosmani is a new site, so my dear colleague and friend Bidzo is the, uh, one of the discoverers of the area. I mean, it was known before, 
but uh, they stood Bizo, uh, so Georgi Bizinashvili and his um, our friends and colleagues, they, they are working there now. He's the leading the excavation. And uh, so the site was um, opened up uh, and discovered in 2019 and 2019 or 20 and 21, they started to do the excavations last year, uh, the first year season and this year they did. And um, the site is like a sister site to the site, uh, site to Dmanisi. We have the same geological situation, more or less, like we have the lava there and fauna is very similar. Um, and it is also just as rich as Dmanisi. And the bones are, uh, I mean, there are a few square meters excavated and it's very rich and it's coming. A lot of bones are coming and, uh, they have discovered um, last year already the stone tools and so they knew it was a human occupation because if there are stone tools there must be humans who made them right but this year they have found the the tooth and this tooth ha has to be still studied so i will not say much about <laughs> about it but it's a human tooth and uh, so that's that's a uh, um, yeah, congratulations to us all for this new opportunity and to, to broaden our horizons of the human evolution knowledge. And I think uh, Orosmani is a very important site because um, now it broadens the, uh, the, the, the it, it concentrates and it, uh, uh, it, it's important to understand the broadness of human occupation. So it's not only the Manisi location, but it has been much broader the, where the hominins occupied the area. So, so this gives a lot of new insights and we have a lot of new opportunities now to, to study and Amazing. hope we do it and we continue, yes. Yeah, and it's great that uh, scientists are able to share now what they find right away rather than uh, as well in the past right you'd have to wait for publication because before you can share it and i was seeing on facebook that uh, the local government of manisi was actually sharing the news yeah, yeah. on their facebook and i think that's a wonderful thing that the public is able to uh, be informed and appreciate the news that's coming out of archaeology and yeah. anthropology yes yes so uh, yeah that's great um, there are a couple of other questions in the chat box uh, from uh, Chen. Did I say this correctly? How likely are the five individuals were from burials or at least with their bodies intentionally disposed of? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it is interesting because, yes, obviously people might think if they're so close could, could have been something mm -hmm. there, but no, I don't think there were burials at that time. There is no sign of them being buried and they would not, at that time, they were not burying each other. Um, so maybe they were dragged by an animal there, but not, not buried, definitely not buried. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and there is another question uh, from Uno Armena. I just want to ask if the site of the Dmanisi a private land or government owned? Is it a protected area since there are treasure hunters or looters might exploit the site? It is a, it is a protected area. So it's like a reserve. So we have guard there. And uh, um, just to speak about looters, I mean, for looting it, like what do you do with a bone? <laughs> It's not, uh, that's the, if, even if they, um, if somebody takes a bone, it has without context, without research, it has no value at all. And no research or collection or anybody would touch that. No, it has nothing. So I don't think it's an interest of looters. It is protected, but mostly because, uh, not because of looting, I would say, but just so that it's maybe somebody by accident, break something not not that anything is visible there it's all protected we cover after every excavation season you do the conservation nothing is for the public but uh, um, uh, because some areas are already excavated and there is the basalt visible 
basalt is dangerous for humans who walk on it. So if they fall, they might get hurt. So that's, that's one of the reasons you have to not allow people having direct access to, to the excavating, uh, excavated blocks because it's simply dangerous if you fall on it. And uh, other, other is like, I mean, in Manisi, there is not nothing to, yeah. The only thing is that somebody may break something at, at if the excavation is ongoing and something is visible, but we have the guards there. So, and it's a protected area. People cannot just walk in. Before, Annie, before the, uh, the Paleolithic layer was discovered mm -hmm. and uh, the classical archeologists were excavating for the medieval and the Bronze Age, layers was there a problem with looting not really um, i mean not that i know at least i, I don't know i mean in manisi we have the medieval time and then we have bronze age as well i mean manisi is, uh, is an archaeological uh, wonder you have all, all the times you just start from top and you just go to the basalt and you have all the layers people were always there somehow caucasus is a crossroad and you always have it occupied so we have uh, uh, Bronze Age and we have Medieval, but uh, there were usually the looters and those who want to steal something, they are for gold or something like this or some coins, but uh, I don't, the, in Manisi we don't have, we have beautiful uh, ceramics, for example, it's wonderful if you see, you have to see it. those ceramics and the colors, the color green and blue is amazing what they were doing. And we have some glass uh, uh, bracelets or something, but uh, looters, no, people usually, uh, they love that it's there and they, they loved Manisi. Uh, I, I, we have no case that somebody tries to vandalize it. We have some vandalism on the walls of medieval people, you know, in the Soviet times so sometimes and probably now too, but now it's, you, people don't do it so much when they write their names on the walls that we have, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people do that here even in remote caves. So they yeah. leave their cell phone numbers on the walls of caves. Uh, interesting Great. behavior. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So thank you very much, Annie. Uh, you know, uh, if yeah. someone was to fall into the basalt that Annie was mentioning, uh, it's like falling into hard coral. It's like that. It's not very pleasant, right? Yeah. It's, it's dangerous. We yeah. had a case, you remember one of the students cut the, who cut the leg. It was not a dangerous thing, but it's also very sharp. They are. The, the stone there is very sharp. And uh, with regard to, to burial, intentional burial, um, yeah, I don't think any of the skeletons were uh, articulated, right? Whether animal or human. And, oh, animal, yes. And I've seen photos of, uh, of the skulls being extracted and they're like under some overhangs and they seem to be in dens. Yeah, I mean, there is a hyena den there. Uh, we know it, uh, but... Uh, I, I, I mean, it would be speculation too much to tell what brought them there. So I don't want to go into that. And it's better if a expert, Martha or uh, Reed Coyle and Reed Faring, they speak about this because that's what they look more, in, more into it. But uh, yeah, there are hyena dens uh, and uh, chances are they brought it, but chances are that also some, somehow they fell into this. So um burial not articulated bones of animals we have like um for example deer food or the the spine we do have that in articulation but hominin bones no articulation uh, um, there was one there's a comment from azmi razak saying thank you for the interesting presentation i am interested to know if there was any study on age estimation using the third molars as what is commonly carried out now in the mo in modern dentistry. Thank you. Thank you for a very actual question. Um, that's the future plan. So we will do that. But uh, the third molars are um, in one case, not fully erupted in one newly erupted. So, and uh, yeah, it, it will give a lot of information. Yes. So third molars are there to tell the age to us. 
there's enough to study in the Manisi for <laughs> generations of scientists. Just so much. Yes, yeah. so it is. And uh, the Georgians have been so generous in uh, collaborating with uh, foreign researchers. Um, yeah, I, so. I think if, uh, if there is no collaboration, you cannot move uh, too much ahead because uh, you cannot know it all. So there is a field that you are an expert in, but then, uh, then you need inputs and this way you understand the site better because when you have all kind it has to be multidisciplinary and uh, it, it must be you cannot just stick with uh, being for example I, I study teeth you cannot just stick to the teeth only teeth cannot tell if you don't expand your collaborations and have a big umbrella to understand how they were living it's like uh, I, I often tell also to the students, when they look in the, in the mouth of the patients, uh, being a dentist is not only looking at the teeth. You cannot look at the teeth. Mouth is the mirror. You have to have the big picture. As soon as you start looking only at the teeth, then, then you're not a dentist anymore. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> so it's context, really. It's context. It applies yeah. to everything, even yes. beyond archaeology. <laughs> So yes. thank you so much. Alfred, do you have any more questions? Uh, I'm, I'm checking on YouTube, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's all so far. I, I was uh, wondering about, um, about the faceless uh, skull and, and uh, the uh, possibility that um, that individual fell prey to a, to a large carnivore. And then I was wondering, uh, uh, it, it was found in, in close uh, proximity to the other skulls, right? So, so, but they don't show any such signs. So how, how come they are all together? Um, so, um, the, the two, uh, so there are five skulls. Three of them are found very close. The, co the, mm -hmm. the, the scheme I showed you, you remember the, I, I could share the screen, I don't know. Uh, mm. Oh, one moment, I will, oh, sorry, sorry, let me show this once again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this one, mm -hmm. for example, the, here we have three of those, like the big one, uh, the, uh, the juvenile one and the, the, the toothless one. But there are two more and they are not in this area. Two more are about like 20 meters away, which would be these ones are 20 meters away. Uh -huh. uh, um, well, the, the others, the faces don't show anything, but we still have to do the research, right? Um, uh, this... Uh, I mean, this is a case study of this specific individual that we presented, but uh, there, is, uh, there are other body parts that we have to study and maybe mm -hmm. we find something interesting there that would say, I mean, yes, the face is the one of the first things to attack, but also uh, the limbs are there and so on. And uh, we, we still have to look into now. I mean, what we did was it was a case study of that specific cranium and that was it, but there is so much more to look into. Like uh, also for the traumas, um, we, we will look into the other skulls uh, to see, to find maybe something similar, maybe not, but there is plenty of things to do. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, that's, that's actually, yeah, it's quite fascinating. And, and what I find uh, totally amazing for such an, an early site that, yeah, this richness, as, as you described, and, and that we have these five skulls and, and that they are uh, relatively close together and, and each of them telling an, an amazing uh, story. And yeah, going back to, to variation, uh, and, and probably you and, and Mylene had the, the, a similar experience. Uh, I remember John DeVos at, at Naturalis, and he would, I think it, he, it was a standard. He would always go to the 
uh, John DeVos was uh, at Naturalis, the curator of the Dubois collection. Um, and he would always go there and, and show us a, uh, a box. So it was actually, it was a drawer full of molars uh, from, from orangutan, from, from Trinil. And, and they were all different. So just like what you showed us with the chimpanzees, they were all different. Then he would, he would complain about this habit, like what Tanya said earlier, you, you find one human bone and you want to make it a new species. And he would tell us, look at those molars. It's all orangutan and how different they are. And, and yeah, so that was kind of a deja vu when, when uh, you yes. showed us the same thing on the chimpanzee. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That, that's that's true. I mean, you see it. Oh, this you see you see these differences in teeth. Teeth are so variable that you you cannot rely on them in that <laughs> aspect. <laughs> you never know. I mean, yeah, of course, you, teeth are variable, but they now this variation is also very well described. That teeth are one of the best studied, obviously. So. I, it's a joke that you cannot rely on them. You can rely on them because teeth give a lot of information. So, but yeah, you have to keep in mind the variation. That's the, that's the thing. Yes. Amazing. We have a couple of comments in the chat box from John Beavis saying, thank you for your presentation. And also from Anthony Alindayu. Thank you, Mam Ann. Thank you very much for them for listening, for the interesting discussion and questions. It was a real pleasure. <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions and comments? Alfred, Edo? I think no more. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let me also thank you so much for today's presentation, for, for joining our webinar and, and sharing this amazing stories, not just one story, many stories uh, on Manisi. Thank it's you. really great having you here, and um, thank you. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Well, Annie, wonderful to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, my Mylene. Thank Hope you. to see you again soon in person. I treasure our collegiality and friendship very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Yeah, before we... Before we end our today's webinar, uh, please take note in the chat box of the evaluation form. So please answer the evaluation form that uh, is linked uh, in the chat box. And let me also announce next talk, uh, which it will take a while because we, we, we are taking a break due to two upcoming conferences. One is the annual conference of the Anthropological Association in the Philippines. That's next week in Marinduque at Marinduque State College. And then um, from November 6 to 12, I think, is the uh, Congress of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association. So uh, I guess we are participating there. So we will have our next webinar after the IPPA Congress, and that will be on November 17. And our speaker will be no other than Francois Sema, uh, which I think Anne, you know also very well from the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. I have met him, but I don't know <laughs> him very well because I did my, P uh, my master in Portugal and Spain, so. Uh, okay, but uh, so, so probably once but or twice. I know him, yes, I know him, yes, yes. <laughs> so from the literature. <laughs> yeah. And that's, All right. and that's something to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, thank then. You. thank you very much again. And.